Hello, this is uh, Dr. Muhammad, and this is uh, Design of Steel Structures according to AISC. And I'm going to talk about an introduction for this video. Actually, the video contents, as you can see, it is uh, going to be um, three main points or topics that I'm going to talk about. The first one is building codes and specifications. What are the major differences between uh, the two? And then I'm going to talk about the structure steel, the type of it, and mm, the different types, I mean. And in the same time, I'm going to talk about the stress string curve uh, uh, for different types of steel. And then after that, I'm going to uh, give an exposure uh, regarding standard cross-sectional shapes that is going to be used in our design in general. Okay, let's go directly to the first point which is going to be as I said building codes and specifications so uh, first of all we want to understand what is the uh, the meaning of building codes from different uh, points or based on different points so first of all let me uh, go with this uh, hint which is an important hint to understand the legal or from the legal point of view what or how we can look to the building codes okay buildings must be designed and constructed according to provisions of building codes which is a legal document containing requirements related to such things as structure safety fire safety plumbing ventilation so the key word here is legal document so it is considered to be a legal document a building code has the force of law and is administered by government building codes does not or building code do not give design procedures this is an important issue here which is different than other things it does not or building codes do not give design procedures but they specify the design requirement just they are giving some requirements for the design but they do not prescribe or give any design procedures and constraints that must be satisfied so they are providing design requirements and constraints that must be satisfied and the u.s there is three different codes uniform building code national building code and standard building code a unified building code which we call it the international building code international code council okay has been developed to eliminate some of the inconsistencies among the three national building codes. There is an important, <clears throat> uh, we can say code, it is loading code, which is ASCE, American Society for Civil Engineers. Uh, seven, we call it the minimum design loads for buildings and other structures, okay? Is similar in uh, form to a building code. This standard provides load requirements in a format suitable for adoption as part of a code. The International Building Code incorporates much of ASCE 7 in its load provisions. Whenever it comes to the load provisions, you are going to find that IBC or the International Building Code is uh, making reference to ASCE 7. So we need to know or to have an exposure to it and to be familiar with uh, this ASCE 7 because it is going to be very important for us especially whenever we are talking about load combinations okay let's go now and understand what is the meaning of specification design specification so in contrast to building codes design specifications give more specific guidance okay so it is going to give you more details for the design of structural members and their connections Design specifications represent good engineering practice based on the latest research. And they are periodically revised and updated by the issuance of supplements or completely new additions, as you can see if we're talking about AISC. So we're going to find that different editions are always provided and it is periodically revised and uh, different issues are issued every almost three years or more okay as with model building codes design specifications are written in a legal format by nonprofit organizations they have no legal standing on 
their own okay so remember that they do not have any kind of legal standing so this is an important issue actually whenever that you are <clears throat> designing or reviewing uh, a building or a project it is important to keep in your mind that it is only like giving you specific guidance but it has no legal obligation upon you okay so that's the the point uh, so they have no legal standing on their own but they but by presenting design criteria and limits in the form of legal mandates and prohibitions they can easily be adopted by reference as part of the building code okay so this is the difference between the building code and specifications now <clears throat> let's go and see what are the specifications of most interest to the structural steel designer are those published by the following organization we have actually like important four different <clears throat> uh structure steel uh, we can say specifications that very important for the structure steel designer in general first of all the american institute of steel construction we call it aisc aisc this specification provides more uh, provides for the design of structure steel buildings and their connections it is the one of primary concern in our uh, in our videos in our course here the second specification we call it American Association of, of State Highway and Transportation Officials. We call it for short ASH2. This specification covers the design of highway bridges and related structures. It provides for all structure materials normally used in bridges, including steel, reinforced concrete, and timber. Uh, uh, the third specification is the American Railway Engineering and Maintenance of Way Association, ARIMA. Okay. The ARIMA Manual of Railway Engineering covers the design of railway bridges and related structures. This organization was formerly known as the American Railway Engineering Association. And the last specification, number four, which is important for us, is the American Iron and Steel Institute, AISI. This specification deals with cold formed steel, which we are going to discuss. Actually, we are not going to discuss in our course, but it is related to the, uh, in the textbook that we are using. So in general, what is important for us, we are going to highly concentrate on AISC. This is our main concern in our code we are not going to discuss about uh, or refer to ash2 or arima or aisi here uh, maybe to some extent we can find this cold form but actually it's not the main concern of our uh, course okay <clears throat> okay now let's go to the structure steel and try to understand more about the types of structure steel we have commonly different types of steel we are going to know uh, some of them today so we have first we have here <clears throat> mild steel this is the first type of uh, of structure steel that we are going to face and we are going to use in our course so the characteristics of steel that are of the most interest to structure engineers can be examined by plotting results of the tensile test whenever that we have a specimen and we put put it under tensile loading as you can see here we put it under tensile loading this specimen is going to elongate so this relation between the tensile force that is being applied and the strain that is going to be developed we can plot it here okay so we are going to plot the relation between the uh, stress versus strain the stress is going to be this force divided by the area or the cross-sectional area of this element that or this bar which is going to be given as you can see here in this equation f which is the stress equal to p over a and the horizontal axis it is going to be the strain which is going to be obtained by dividing delta L the elongation over the original L as you can see it here in this equation okay so everything now we know about these two equation of the stress and strain that is 
F, we call it the axial tensile stress, okay? And A, it is the cross-sectional area of the bar. This epsilon is axial strain, and L, it is the length of the specimen, and delta L, it is the change in the length, as we can see here. <clears throat> we are going to say that this stress, we are going to call it engineering stress. What is the reason for this? Actually, because whenever that we are going to apply the force here, the cross-sectional area is going to be reduced. This is due to Poisson's effect. Okay, So this cross-area, so actually it should uh, be reduced. But actually, as you can see here, we can find that we are using the cross-sectional area. So this is why we are not, uh, this is why we are referring to it as the engineering stress. It is not the like actual stress here. So although the cross-section is reduced during the loading due to the Poisson's effect, the original cross-section area is used to compute all stresses. Stress computed in this way is known as engineering stress. So we call this engineering stress. Definitely, if you are going to say this is engineering stress, we are going to call this as the engineering strain. Okay, the engineering strain. Okay, before jumping to the next slide, we want to look to the stress strain curve for the mild steel. So as you can see here, <clears throat> with this bold curve here, we have different phases for this curve. The first part, we call it the elastic part. We denote it as elastic. And this part, whenever that we remove the load, okay, the original state of the building is going to be uh, like going to uh, uh, return again or at least we are going to find that during the unloading phase the structure is going to follow the same path of the loading phase and this would remain until one point here we call it proportional limit and then there is something else called another limit called elastic limit and after that the upper yield point and after that there is a lower yield point this is the area of yielding here and after that it is followed by a plateau as you can see here this is we're going to call it the yield of the steel this area which is the plateau here we call it plastic area plastic area if there is unloading in this area you're going to find that this dashed line is going to be the unloading case where that you are going to see there is residual kind of strain. So there is some part that is not going to be used or some part that is going to be uh, considered as a residual strain. Okay, now let's go to the next part, which is the next phase. We call it the strain hardening. The strain hardening, this part starting from here and going like as you can see it here. So this part until here. This strain hardening, as you can see, the stress is increased. The stress is increased. So the material is showing uh, higher stress, higher than the yield even, until it reaches to a point here, which is the start of a phase. We call it nicking and failure. So we're going to find that there is nicking phase is going to start here in the structure or, or the, uh, in this, in this uh, specimen. There is nicking here the cross section here is going to be uh, highly reduced until that we reach the failure okay so this is regarding the mild steel <clears throat> this is regarding the mild steel <clears throat> okay now let's go to the next part as i said this is the if the original length is used to compute the strain it is called the engineering strain engineering strain steel ductility can be measured by the elongation so actually the engineering strain if we go back here so this one is going to be the engineering strain okay and the steel ductility can be measured by the elongation as this is we call it the steel ductility lf minus l node over l node times 100 where e it is the elongation expressed as a percent and LF, it is the length of the specimen at fracture at the end here. Okay. And L node, it's the original length. If we go back here, so yes, so all of this distance, 
sorry, is from here to here. This is LF. Okay, the stylus is not helping me so much. Sorry for this. And this is, of course, it is L. Okay, so this is by which we can obtain the steel ductility. Okay, sometimes we can idealize the stress strain curve in a format that is easy for us to understand and to maintain and to manipulate. So actually we can say that the area or the point that is there was three points here we are going to say that it is only one point here and we are going to call it yield point f yield and the maximum stress that is going to be reached we are going to call it ultimate tensile strength which is f ultimate okay and then we are going to draw it in this way it's very easy for for us okay and then we are going to look to the first portion, which is the elastic portion, and we are going to talk about the, the slope of it. We're going to call it Young's models. So the ratio of stress to strain within the elastic range, denoted as E, and called Young's models, or modulus of elasticity, is the same for all structural steel and has the value of 29 million PSI, pounds per, per square inch, or 29,000 KSI kips per square inch. Okay, so this is very common. Remember, Will, it is constant for all types of steel. There is no difference. We are going to use it for any type of steel, whether it is mild steel or high strength steel or anything else. Okay, now we have understood now what is the meaning of mild steel. Now let's go to the next part, which is related to the high strength steel and understand more about it. Now let's talk about this high strength steel. As you can see here, the stress strain curve is totally different than the mild steel. First of all, you cannot see the plateau and the well-defined yield point. It is something, as you can see, like smoothly making the transition between the elastic range to the inelastic range and maximum tensile strength and the failure after that. It is really smooth here, where we can obtain this. So. Uh, we, where we can obtain the F yield. First of all, the most important thing that is characterizing high strength steel is there is no well-defined yield point or yield plateau. Okay, so this is there is no yield well-defined yield point or yield plateau. Well, how we can obtain the yield? How we can obtain that and say that this point is the yield point here? Then there is a method called the 0.2% offset method for determining the yield strength. So actually we are, the yield stress for steel with the stress strength curve of the type shown is called yield strength and is defined as the stress of the point unloading that corresponds to a permanent strain of some arbitrarily defined amount. So here we are going to come at the strain axis and we are going to measure 0.2%. And then we're going to draw this dashed line parallel to the elastic range. This dashed line is going to intersect the original curve <clears throat> at, at a point. This point we are going to call it, exactly, we are going to call it the yield strength of this material. Okay. Okay. A strain of 0 0.002 is usually selected. And this method of determining the yield strength is called... 0.2% offset method. Okay, so that's how we can obtain the yield, uh, the yield strength. Regarding the tensile strength, which is F ultimate, it is very easy because the maximum value here it is going to be F ultimate. As previously mentioned, the two properties usually needed in a structure steel design are F ultimate and F yield. Right? We said that they are the most important two. Uh, uh, properties, the most important properties that is you are going to find that we are going to use them in everything, almost in every design uh, example, we are going to use one of them or both at least. Regardless of the shape of the stress strength curve and regardless of how F yield was obtained. So always we are going to use F ultimate and F yield. For this reason, the generic term yield stress is used and it can mean either yield point or yield strength. So they are like interchangeable. We can say yield stress or yield strength. Okay, so they are all the yield point. All of them, they are like making the, 
uh, designation of this yield strength F yield. Okay, now let's go next after that work we, we need to go and know about the structure steels and how we can group them based on the composition okay let's go to the next slide yes we have structural steels uh, that can be grouped according to their composition as follows we have three main groups that we can categorize the steel based on which the first one is the first one is the plain carbon steels mostly iron and carbon with less than one percent carbon okay this is the first one which is the mild steel always belonging to okay and number two it is low alloy steels iron and carbon plus other components usually less than five percent the other components are always less than five percent the additional components are primarily for increasing strength that's the point here we are increasing the strength by adding additional components which is accomplished at the expense of reduction and ductility so whenever that we are adding additional components for increasing the strength it is always at the cost of ductility so there is a trade-off here and the third one is going to be high alloy or specific or speciality steels it is similar in composition to the low alloy steels but with a higher percentage of the components added to iron and carbon these steels are higher in strength so they are maintaining the uh, higher strength as we always need than the plain carbon steels which is group number one and also have some special quality such as resistance to corrosion so this is uh, one of the main qualities that we can obtain using high alloy or speciality steels okay so we can group our our structure steel into these three groups okay okay now let's go to the next slide which is related to one of the most commonly used steels let's go so here one of the most commonly used structure steels is mild steel designated as ASTM a36 or a36 for short this is one of the most common commonly used structure steel and its yield stress f yield it is 36,000 psi or 36 ksi and the tensile strength ranges between 58 ksi to 80 ksi okay so this is you need to remember them well and you need to memorize them well because almost in many of our examples we are going to use it okay a36 steel is classified as a plain carbon steel so it is from category number one as we discussed in the previous slide and it has the following components other than iron of course it has carbon phosphorus and sulfur with these percentages here okay this is maximum means that we can get more or we can add uh, sorry uh, less than this this is the maximum to be 0.26 percent we can add less than this value similar to phosphorus which is like 0.04 percent maximum and sulfur 0.05 percent maximum steel producers who provide a36 steel must certify that it meets astm standards so whenever that you are going to design your steel structure you need to always have a uh, certification from the steel provider that it meets the ASTM standard the values for yield stress and tensile strength shown are minimum that's very important it is minimum requirements they may be exceeded and usually are to a certain extent extent this means that this 36 it is the minimum actually in reality you are going to find that the yield stress is higher than that and also for tensile strengths it is this is the minimum you can find that in reality the tensile strength is higher than the value that you used in the design okay and this is why the over strength is always coming from so we, we do not know exactly what is the yield stress the actual yield stress in our used in our members and components uh, whether that we use 36 but actually maybe it is larger than this maybe it is 40 who knows about this from here we can say that there is over strength in this point and we can like have 
more over strength factor in our design. Anyway, the tensile strength is given as a range of values because for A36, as you can see here, this is a field, it is given as specific value. However, for the tensile strength, it is a range. What is the reason for this? Because this tensile strength cannot be achieved to the same degree of precision as the yield strength. We cannot, based on the experiments and so on, we cannot get the accuracy of the yield uh, stress as we, whenever that we are measuring the, the tensile strength. Okay? Okay, now let's jump to the next slide to see what are other types of steel that we can use in our design. So, other commonly used structural steels are ASTM A572 grade 50 and ASTM A992. They are the two major high strength steels or common high strength steels, structural steels that is being used and we call them high strength steel. So anyway, now for the most common structural steels that we're going to use in this course, we're going to focus on these three ones. This is mild and these two are going to be high strengths. Uh, the minimum yield point for A36, it is 36, and uh, tensile strengths range between 58 to 80. For uh, A572, the yield point minimum is 50, similar to A992, and the tensile strength is 65, similar also to A992. Okay, so this is uh, like the major and the most important uh, properties that we need to use. Let's go and see what is the typical stress strength curves for similar or for these kinds of steel in the next slide. So this is the typical stress strength curve. This is the typical stress strength curve, as you can see. So in the horizontal axis, it is the strain vertical axis it is the stress in kips per square inch and here the first one here which is this curve which is curve a it is the carbon steels which is like a36 for example as you can see here this is the yield a field 36 ksi the curve b as you can see it here this is the high strength low alloy carbon steels a572 Two, as you can see it here, it is having uh, like higher strengths and the yield is higher as well. Okay, so it is, uh, maybe you are going to ask that we said before that for high strengths it is not well defined here. Actually, uh, the yield should not be well defined, but actually for this type of high strength steel, okay, high strengths with low alloy carbon steels, this type of, uh, of steels, uh, because it is, it has no heat treatment it has no heat treatment so it has a well-defined yield stress even if it is high strength steels okay so this is like because of the way of production itself it can be provided with or at least it can give us a very well-defined f yield and higher strength than the mild steel uh, this one, it is considered to be the real high strength steel, which is we do not know exactly where is the F yield uh, here. We call this uh, heat treated construction, constructural alloy steels, A514, quenched and tempered alloy steel. This is heat treatment. So we're going to find it's very high here. The yield is almost like around 100, minimum yield strength around 100. And the strengths here, it is very high also compared to these kind of steels that we are talking about. And we are going to use the 0.2% offset strategy or scheme in order to obtain the yield here. Okay, so this is the typical stress strength curves for different types of steel. Now let's go to the last part of our course uh, for our uh, video for today, which is the standard cross-sectional shapes. Yes. So we're going to talk about the standard cross-sectional shapes that we are going to uh, use in our examples and applications. So actually we have standard cross-sectional shapes here. We have different shapes we are going to refer to them. So you need to be familiar with them before starting the course. Uh, commonly we are going to use what we call it the wide shape or wide flange. As you can see here, the flanges are a little bit 
uh, wider compared to the American standard that we are using uh, commonly. So the white flange, you're going to find that uh, here W18, this means that the height of this cross section is plus or minus 18 inch. And the, uh, this is the weight per unit uh, length of it. We call it the wide shape. This is the web. This is the two flanges here. And then we are going, we, we have also another type of standard cross section. We call it American standard, which is denoted by S. Here, this one is denoted by W. S18 by 70, for example. This is the height also is 18 uh, inches. And we have sloping inside face, as you can see it here. Then we have equal leg angles, as you can see it here, with the two legs are equal and the thickness is going to be given. So this is L6 by 6 by 3 over 4, means that uh, the equal length for the two legs and the thickness is the same. Okay. And after that unequal leg, as you can see, one leg is shorter than the other and the thickness is given here. It is the same for both legs. This is what we call it the angle. And then we have this one, which is the American standard channel. Okay, we call it C9 by 20. So nine means that the height of the channel 20, it is the weight per unit length, similar to the white flange and the standard American standard. And then we have the T and the structural T, which is WT means that it's cut from a white flange or ST cut from the American standard or M. T miscellaneous, it means that it is not W and not S, it's miscellaneous cross section and it has been cut to be T. WT, for example, means 18. The height is 18 inches, as you can see, and the second one is the weight per unit length. We have bars, as you can see, which is, as you can see, this is the bars here, which is solid from inside. We have plates which should be larger, the width of the plate should be larger than 8 inch. But if it is less than 8 inches, then it, it, we call it bar. We have steel pipe, as you can see here, hollow from inside, and it has a thickness. We have hollow structure steels, or sorry, ho hollow structure sections, which means that it is going to be, uh, as you can see here, whether it is square or rectangle or uh, or hollow structure steel in uh, shape of a pipe, similar to the pipe. Okay, but the, we have like standard sections for steel pipe, and we have another standard section for hollow structure steel sections for the circular shape. Then we have another types which is like plate girders coming from built-up sections, uh, wide flanges with cover plates. As you can see, we add some cover plates at the top and bottom flanges. We have plate girders here, which is going to be composed of the web is going to be doubled, for example. Double angle, we put, we put them back to back or double channel, two channels back to back. Okay, uh, we have two types of sections commonly used and commonly mentioned, which is hot rolled sections and we have cold rolled, uh, cold formed sections. For the hot rolled sections, generally these are the hot rolled sections, as you can see. All of them we, we have explained about, about them. The white flange, American standard, American standard channel, the angle or the T's section, pipe section, structural tubing, bars, plates, all of them, they are hot rolled. What is the meaning of hot rolled? Actually, it is basically, it is related to the manufacturing process. And the hot rolled manufacturing process, it takes place in, in a mill. Molten steel is taken from an electric arc furnace and poured into a continuous casting system where the steel uh, solidifies but is never allowed to cool completely. That's the that's the key here. It is never allowed to cool completely. The hot steel passes through a series of rollers that squeeze the material into the desired cross-sectional shape. Rolling the steel while it is still hot allows it to be deformed with no resulting loss in ductility. That's is another key that you need to remember whenever that we mention about hot rolled. So the process itself, the process itself, it is the manufacturing process. It is the point is we are like uh, pouring the molten steel, okay, taken from the electric arc furnace, and we put it 
in a casting system, but we never allow it to cool completely. And then we can deform, okay? <clears throat> so there are some rollers, series of rollers. They are going to uh, provide the desired cross-section that we want. But rolling the steel while it is hot, that's the point here. It is hot. Allows it to be deformed with no resulting loss in ductility. That's the main uh, advantage. It is in, in comparison with or in contrast with the cold formed, as would be the case with cold, for, cold, cold working. No, it is or cold formed or the cold formed sections. It is different than this. We are not like we are not shaving it. Uh, while that the material is hot. This is not the case if we are going to talk about the cold formed as we are going to talk here. So the cold formed steel created by bending thin plates used for secondary members Berlin and Girth and it is in using the cold steel, not hot trolled steel. These are uh, common shapes that is being used for the cold formed channels these I-shaped double channels, angles, and hat sections, they are commonly used for secondary members. We are not going to use them and study them in our uh, course, okay? It's only for information. The last slide maybe is going to be about what is the preferred type of steel that is used for every shape. So for angles and plates, A36 is commonly the main preferred steel material for American Standard for miscellaneous for channels for miscellaneous of channels we are commonly find them in A36 or A572 grade 50 HPs they are going to be A572 grade 50 wide flanges commonly they are high strength steels they are A992 pipe it is A53 grade B only choice and hollow structure steel or hollow structure sections, it is A500 grade B or C. By this, I think that we are uh, reaching the end of our class. Thank you very much, and I hope that you get benefit from what I have explained, and see you soon.